from chapter 10 of A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. What is school? For children, school can be understood as love and parenting commodified. Put another way, part of what school is, is parenting that has been outsourced. We have already seen many of the harms and risks of reductionism. Yet one more is that reductionism facilitates the commodification of easily quantifiable things, while tending to ignore those things that are less quantifiable. Thus, school becomes about metrics. How much? How fast? How well? Do the little one read? Do their multiplication tables? Memorize a poem? It should go without saying that there is clear and enduring value in reading, multiplication, and poetry. A focus on speed and quantity is an error, however. With my what myriad things are not being learned in school because they succumb less easily to reductionist assessments? School is based on an economic efficiency while being unimaginative about what could be accomplished. The economics, not to mention the perverse incentives behind compulsory schooling, of school tend to fill children's heads with knowledge without showing them a path to wisdom. Perhaps school should serve the purpose of helping young people grapple with the question, who am I and what am I going to do about it? That incidentally, that the footnote there is to Derek Jensen's excellent book on education. Another way of phrasing this might be, what's the biggest and most important problem I can solve with my gifts and skills? Or how do I find my consciousness, my truest self? Done well, then, school can provide a great platform for formalizing and delivering rites of passage. Rather than focusing on any version of these questions, though, modern schooling, especially the compulsory sort widespread across the weird world, is more apt to teach quiescence and conformity. What if we took, as one of the goals of school, teaching children how to understand and hack their own incentive structures? Knock them off the low adaptive peaks that they are surely on. I'm not good at math, languages, or sports. Or conversely, I'm so good at math, languages, sports, that other things fail to grab my attention. What if we knock them off those low adaptive peaks into valleys that are uncomfortable, but from where there are many possible peaks to climb? Or perhaps school should reveal to children that fringe positions should be explored and considered, not thrown out immediately on the basis that they are unpopular. Betting against the fringe is an easy bet, usually a safe one, and when done in a tone of paternalistic indulgence, say, or authoritarian disdain, it usually shuts down dissent. While most fringe ideas are in fact wrong, it is exactly from the fringe that progress is made. This is where the paradigm shifts happen. This is where innovation and creativity occur, and yes, most of it is wrong or useless, but the most important ideas on which we now base our understanding of the world and our society came from the fringe. The sun is the center of the solar system. Species adapt their environments over time. Humans can create technology that allows us to communicate across time and space, to fly, to create and explore virtual worlds. These were all impossible ideas, laughable at the time. Those who quickly join in laughing at all fringe ideas now would have been laughing at all of those ideas in their time. School should be fun, but it should not be gameable. A child shouldn't be able to win at school, although many do and many more lose at it. Social rules and mores are learned at school, but at its base, school should be about discovering truth, both universal and local. School is, for better and for worse, a stand-in for parents, for kin group, for those with whom the child has shared fate. School should not, therefore, teach through fear. Risk and challenge help children learn. As with parenting, this requires early tight bonding, during which a secure base is established, which provides children the confidence to go out adventuring fairly early, because they know that someone has their back no matter what. School that operates by fear will teach the opposite lesson. Fear is an easy mechanism of control, and so it should not be surprising that teachers use fear to control students of all ages. As corporal punishment in the classroom fell out of favor in many, but not all places, psychological and emotional control replaced it. It leaves few remarks. Children are threatened with poor grades, poor test scores, and having their parents informed that they have behaved badly, which most children will hear as, you're a bad person. The rise of metrics within a system, which are often overly simple, wrong-headed, and only pseudo-quantitative, tends to accompany a decay in social trust. How can good teachers, stuck in a system of escalating metrics imposed from the outside, counteract the prevailing cultural forces? One approach, which will be more effective with older children and young adults, is for teachers to explicitly hand away their own authority by telling students not to trust them just because they are the figure in the front of the room. When a teacher then does earn the respect and the trust of her students such that she becomes a legitimate authority figure, one with authority that was earned rather than assumed, her authority will better serve both the students and their education. Using fear to keep children seated in neat and tidy rows, to keep their eyes forward and their mouths closed, to keep them from moving their bodies at all but for a few scheduled moments in each day, this will help create adults who are unable to regulate their own bodies and senses, 
unable to trust in their own ability to make decisions, and likely to demand similarly controlled environments in their adult lives, trigger warnings, safe spaces, and the like. For young school children, one solution would be having a garden at school and spending time in it in all sorts of weather. Frequent field trips to natural areas and spending time actually outside rather than in the climate-controlled protection of the nature center will help too. Will it always be comfortable? No. Will some children be ill-prepared for rain or wind or sun? Yes. Will they learn from small early mistakes to start taking responsibility for their own bodies and fates and so get better at navigating the world? Yes. Yes, they will. Humans are anti-fragile. Exposure to discomfort and uncertainty, physical, emotional, and intellectual is necessary. Preparing students to understand risk encourages them to expand their worldviews and embrace experiences that lead to maturity. This does, however, come at a cost. Sorry, I lost it. Understanding risk cannot completely protect individuals from danger. In short, risk is risky. Tragedies will happen, and that's no minor thing. For those of us who have been lucky to avoid it, it's nearly impossible to imagine how a person continues on if their child has died, or if they have been involved in someone else's child dying. Tragedies that happen because someone introduced risk into a school trip are easy to point to. The story is often easy to tell and compelling to hear. By contrast, population level tragedies, those that happen because whole swaths of the population have difficulty navigating risk and so avoid it at all costs, this is also a tragedy and much further reaching. Modern school tends to protect against individual tragedies while facilitating the larger societal ones. Arrange all little boys and girls neatly in rows, assign them seats, and tell them never to speak unless they are called on first, because that will make it easier to keep track of them. At the same time, at home, teach the little boys and girls that they are each the center of the entire universe, and that they may and in fact should interrupt adults at any moment for any reason. Teach the children that temper tantrums are acceptable by caving to them whenever they erupt, and also tell the children that they are the most precious and infallible beings in existence, and as such, any criticism is a crime against their core selves. We should not be surprised when children raised this way can make no sense of the confused and confusing messages coming at them from home and from school. Nor should it surprise us when they gravitate to the systems that are most gameable. Mom doesn't like it when I scream or whine, but if I persist at it, she gives in as a way to make me stop? Noted. Teacher leaves me alone if I occasionally contribute a comment in class and earn good grades, even though I'm learning nothing by regurgitating from a textbook? Got it. Congratulations, society, you've successfully produced self-satisfied whiners who are accustomed to getting what they want, who are good at school but not at thinking, and who are in fact neither smart nor wise. One and a half page excerpt uh, from, again, the school chapter of a higher, hmm, a hunter-gatherer's guide to the 21st century. <clears throat> This section is called, The World is Not About You, from the school chapter. Children have been harmed through, new f through no, mm, oh boy. The world, did I mention that the cat drank my water? Here, <laughs> yeah, okay, I so have some. I would, yes, I would love some of your water because um, you did not put your paw on this. No, <laughs> not, not even once. Thank you, much better. The world is not about you. Children have been harmed through no fault of their own by a perfect storm of societal factors that emerged in the late 20th and early 21st century, which we have already reviewed. The rise of pharmaceuticals being prescribed to children, helicopter and snowplow parenting, and the near ubiquity of screens, never mind what is on them, have all made school an even more difficult place than it once was. In the United States, add to these the economic and political forces that have reduced school funding while increasing testing, thus cutting the creativity and freedom of teachers off at the knees. When Heather, that's me, primed her students for study abroad trips to Panama or Ecuador in advance of embarking with them, she was trying to build not just the academic skills required for the work, but also the social and psychological ones required for extended trips outside of anything most of them had previously experienced. She would ask them, what is your relationship with risk? And what is your relationship with comfort? Just because you can say in advance that you will be okay with the bugs and the mud and the not having access to the internet doesn't mean that you actually will be. Perhaps most important of all, though, we are going to leave ourselves open to serendipity. We cannot know what all will happen on this trip. We're going to go, and some interesting things will happen. Those conversations included discussions of how risk is different in landscapes that haven't been rendered safe by liability lawsuits and in which medical help is far, far away. We talked about the hidden hazards of the jungle, rising water, tree falls, compared with the familiar ones like snakes and big cats that people are primed to be scared of. Risk and potential go hand in hand. We need to let children, including college students, risk getting hurt. Protection from pain guarantees weakness, fragility, and greater suffering in the future. 
The discomfort may be physical, emotional, or intellectual, my ankle, my feelings, my worldview, and all need to be experienced to learn and grow. The students whom we took on study abroad trips were carefully chosen, mature, capable, smart, and adept. Even so, the inability to control our surroundings, the intentionality of succumbing to serendipity when in the jungle, threw many of them into states of confusion, which sometimes manifested as anger. Many of them believed themselves to be excited about exploration, about discovery, but only when it looked and felt as they had already imagined. By inculcating in children the sense that order is always better than chaos, and that being easily counted and prioritizing doing things that are easily counted is the honorable way to go through school, and therefore life, many would extrapolate, society creates adults who bristle at the unexpected and the new. Not only doesn't the jungle look or feel as you are led to believe from even the best nature documentaries, but the people on the streets of Panama City or Quito aren't what you think. The cloud forest and the people who called it home long before the Inca or the Spaniards ever arrived will surprise you too, as will everything else, if you take your blinders off and let yourself experience the world without taking everything so personally. Mostly, the world is not about you, but you can learn from it, and an education should allow you to do just that. Yeah, this is... Uh... You know, it's funny. It seems so obvious that the world is not about you, and yet the nature of one's interaction on the internet, I think, especially if it's, you know, if you're young enough that it is your developmental experience, reifies the false belief that it is about you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, it's, um, it's epistemologically devastating, right? the ability to understand yourself as a biased observer and to try to minimize that is somewhat dependent on your ability to understand that your your centrality to your own perception is a bad thing and not a good thing yeah no that and then that's that's right and that's actually a great segue to i wanted to talk about a little bit about um embodiment as well embodied cognition and embodied perception and you know the idea that um Many people have largely, I think, without having uh, formalized that this is what they believe in their heads, uh, that you can learn sufficiently just by being passive, by taking it in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is one of the less frequently objections to video games as a whole, as a holistic learning environment. And as we said, I think last week, you know, neither of us feel that video games are inherently, a, you know, a, a, a negative, um, but that the higher the proportion of your, uh, your life they take up, the more likely you are to be limited in how you can, re how you can understand yourself in the world. And so there's this, there's this classic pretty immoral, I think, I think it couldn't be done today, uh, research on learning in kittens from 1963 called Movement Produced Stimulation and the Development of Visually Guided Behavior. And it's different from actually from the one that we are more familiar with, um, in which um, pairs of kittens from 10 litters uh, are um, kept in darkness for all but three hours a day. And then for three hours, one of them is basically harnessed up and allowed to move and walk and explore. And then the other one is basically on the other end of like a carousel um, from the one who's harnessed up, but passive. And so everything that the one that the one sees, the other sees as well, but the one is actively engaging with the world in order to interact with it. And uh, the second kitten in each case is um, is only passively experiencing it. And those kittens who only passive experience, passively experience but see everything that the actively engaged kittens do are rendered basically helpless and hopeless. They, they, they can't, they, they cannot make sense of their world later on. Uh, and there, you know, there's, there's plenty of work that has followed from that. There's a whole, you know, field called embodied cognition that recognizes actually that uh, when we are restricted, restricted from moving our own bodies in relation to the world, we find, we find ourselves incapable and often don't recognize that we are incapable. Um, so I think, I think for me, that may be the most important piece that we also lack the recognition of our own incapability. Uh, I found, um, so, you know, an interesting piece by a woman named Speakerman uh, from 2018 called Carousel Kittens, the case for a value-based internet of things. Uh, in which she says human beings are highly complex biological systems with an embodied consciousness that develops intelligence through experience of the world. Technology is making that experience passive rather than active. 
And so this is bigger than school. This is this is about the, you know what what the world is that we are creating for ourselves. But I would say that school too, this model of school where you sit still and you know there's a moment to be active and it's called recess. And maybe we'll even skip recess if we feel like we need to cram more stuff in to study for the test. Um, is is effectively a way of assuring us that our children will grow up incapable of being fully functioning adults. Uh, I, I have tried to encapsulate this in the distinction between knowing how something is done and knowing how to do it, yeah. which sounds like they're yes. synonyms, but they are not, no. right? In other words, you you can know a lot about, um, how, you know, you could you could be a, an avid fan of pole vaulting mm -hmm. and never having never have pole vaulted. And right. the point is you'd be thoroughly inept at the point you attempted it because you know, yes, you could know a lot about what makes a good pole vaulter better than a bad one. But the point is, the knowing isn't in the part of you that is involved in the doing. And the most important thing, and I know that the reason that you're you're uh, making this point central here is that at some level, those who have only received the information don't know which part of it is likely to be false. That's right. right. You can read a textbook they full can't of stuff. Be discerning. Right. They don't know what the truth sounds like and how it sounds different than uh, fictions that are plausible but not right. Mm -hmm. um, and it is essential. The, the ability to, the, you know, discernment is really about that distinction between the things that are actually true and the things that only sound true. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the important uh, border. And, you know, we have an educational system that is obsessed with, you know, delivering things in this abstract form that does not yeah. allow you to detect the distinction. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an absolute tragedy. I think in some sense, uh, you know, you're hitting the nail on the head that the, the passive kitten is a thoroughly disabled kitten, no matter what they've seen. Yes. Right. Yes. You can have been shown the world, but if you didn't take yourself around that world and make decisions, uh, about how you would engage it, um, you you are just a passive vessel, and your passivity early will turn you into someone who can only be passive later. You lose your agency. You lose the potential to be an active and engaged individual in the world. And that's that's what so much of this embodied cognition research is is demonstrating. Which really, it, like like. Like with a lot of evolutionary biology, it feels obvious in retrospect. And it's like, you know, of course, of course you can't separate humans. Um, you, 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 there, there is no simple duality, right? There is no split between mind and body. And you can just, you know, treat the, you know, make sure that your body is functioning and then focus entirely on your mind. They are engaging one another. There are feedback systems and it will not work. Neither will work fully if you treat them as separate systems.